I'm Courtney Richardson. I'm Director of Education and Public Programs at the Cape Ann Museum. I just wanted to welcome you all on the behalf of the museum um, to the 400th anniversary public forum um, planning meeting. I just want to mention, so you might, some of you might not know this, but the museum has had 400th this anniversary on our mind for quite some time. We just had an exhibition, it recently closed, but it was called Unfolding Histories, Cape Ann Before 1900, and that was um, a deeper look at stories and documents and archival material that hasn't before been out for public viewing. Um, and then we also just recently reissued Joe Garland's Gloucester Guide, which is a book um, that has nine walking tours of Gloucester that you can go out and enjoy on your own. So we have a lot more things planned, so just stay tuned, and I'm sure we'll all be talking about that today as well. Um, I'd like to introduce the Dream Team Steering Committee, <laughs> Bob Gillis, Ruth Pino, and Bruce Toby. Thanks for being here. Well, that doesn't set us up, does it? <laughs> Welcome, everybody. I'm, I'm particularly pleased to begin by recognizing the Honorable Mayor, Safathi Romeo Taken. Mayor, you want to say a few words? I thought that might happen. Thank you so much for having us. It's great uh, we need to continue to do this and um, raise some funds. I'd love to get upstairs first about the round tables of art and culture, which is very important. And we relate because we had a local tourist commission. We're trying to now not make people burnt out anymore. We're trying to, we have the DMO who's actually bringing um, tourists to a wonderful, beautiful city. And then the tourist commission, what are we gonna do? We don't wanna make sure. And upstairs they mentioned, you know what? Get the younger generation. What about the arts and culture, the real history? And I was telling them that what was most amazing is I went to the Cape Ann Plein Air and they sold almost, so far, almost $100,000 worth of art, which is amazing. It was fantastic. All week long, we have over 245 people who wanted to come to Gloucester to paint, and we could only choose 45. And the list gets bigger and bigger and longer and longer, and it was amazing. What are the five top pioneers in the country? You tell me. <laughs> but the fact is, we all want to know. But the fact is, um, I videotaped Lenny live. Lenny wasn't ripping a head off a lobster, they were all down the knee. He was telling the culture of Gloucester, the heritage, how. He was talking about just the UU church, why it became, how it became, all the history. He said, do you realize that history? He talked about, we made three inventions in Gloucester. People came, we made three inventions besides Burnside, the UU church, and all this stuff. The history, the younger generation, I got 5,000 hits because, and it was mostly all the other generations that I never even knew that I lived there. And that's what we want to bring. When we bring the 400th, we need to let this younger generation come and become alive and say, this is your heritage. This is your culture. You need to continue it. Do not forget 400 years and all the wonderful people who invented things here, him and him. And, I mean, it was amazing, all the stuff that came out of here and how it all started. And we need to continue that because the younger generation, obviously, they want to hear you. And they don't mind listening on an app, but they don't want to hear just a recording. It's nice when you have a person actually speaking who actually lives through it. Because you know what? His father, you have Joe Orange, like he came and told us about Dogtown and everything else. 96 years old and he's still there. Why aren't we catching with it on film? Why aren't we recording them now? You know what? We need to respect the elders and they know the history and we need to capture that. If anything we need to do is that's our culture and our heritage. I see the council president and several councilors here. I trust you bring the greetings of the council and the blessings of it upon this event. Is that true, Paul? Paul Lundberg? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what we're here to do tonight, um, somewhat quickly, first of all, is give an overview of progress since the last community meeting in the spring. Uh, but then more critically against that backdrop, with all these slides running, giving folks more food for thought on what the 400th can and should be, get your thoughts. This is going to be a process over the course of literally the next couple of years, getting ideas and getting ideas and synthesizing them, assigning them to work groups and keeping this operation strong, rooted in the community, and up and running. 
Folks will come and visit, but they'll be seeing our celebration. It's meant to be for the folk of Gloucester, celebrating their heritage, our history, and our culture. I want to speak to one quick thing by way of background. The lawyer is going to talk about the finance. The bank is going to talk about the process. And then Ruth is going to make perfect sense by talking about some of the aspirations we could be having based on the example, for example, of the 350th celebration back in 1973. From a, a, a financial point of view, some real great work has been done on Beacon Hill uh, to benefit Gloucester's gearing up and getting ready to go with this. Um, the state budget for this current fiscal year, fiscal 19, includes within it an allocation of $125,000 to support Gloucester's efforts in mobilizing a 400th anniversary. And we are gearing up the paperwork effort now, which has been provided to us by uh, the appropriate folk in the state bureaucracy. Um, the first half of that, $62,500. That's going to be seed money for some of the things Bob's going to talk about. Um, but it is also going to be money that we need to match. The match is also underway. We presented to the mayor a request for release to this group of a request in the amount of $30,000 plus, uh, $30, plus dollars, uh, which was graciously left by uh, the estate of a Gloucester gentleman who passed away some time ago. I wish I could tell you his name. We sure will when there's a hand off of that check, um, honor and thank him. Um, that's going to go towards the match, and then Bob's going to talk about some of the other stuff. So the financial footings are coming together so that under the umbrella of Gloucester Celebrations Incorporated, a nonprofit corporation set up for the 375th, we can mobilize resources, not to fund everybody's activities, but to give them the initial seed support to get up and running under the umbrella of this organization with other umbrellas beneath it in turn representing various function areas where we want to capture celebration events. Um, we've realigned Gloucester Celebration so that uh, I'm the president, I'll handle the financial stuff. No, that's not true. Uh, the vice president is Bob Gillis, and uh, Ruth is the clerk. And if ever there was a great team to be part of, it was working with these two guys. So with that said, I'm going to hand off to Bob so you can fill us in on more background. Can you guys move to the other side? The light. Sure. In the light. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Thank you, Bruce, very much. And thank you all for being here tonight. Um, it's been a great process so far. We've been, we've been meeting for, it's been over a year now. Um, we had our last public meeting similar to this back in June at City Hall, and it was really well attended and just a great event overall. Um, but since then, we've had a bunch of hard, hardworking people um, working on a number of different initiatives. Um, one of them is the, is the logo. Um, doesn't seem like it would be a big deal, but it is, because the logo is, is our way of branding um, this event for the 400th anniversary. And we, um, led by uh, Linda Stockman, um, there was a contest, um, and we have selected a logo, which, which is still to be finalized. It's not ready to be unveiled at this point, but it was a, it was a really good process, and, um, and we're, we're, we're still hard at work on that. So something will be coming of that soon. Um, we also have um, a medal uh, process. Um, there will be a medal for the 400th anniversary like there was for the 375th. And we've really benefited by the knowledge of uh, the people before us um, working on this for the 375th. We've been very lucky to have uh, Tom Lance, who owns the Brass Monkey, and uh, Rebecca Reynolds, um, uh, who are two experts in this, in this area of metals. It's been kind of interesting for uh, Bruce, Ruthie, and I to, to sit in the meetings with them, and um, one, per, one, one person will call it a coin, and then the other will, will correct them and say, it's not a coin, it's a metal. Um, so I think we've uh, settled on metal at this point. Um, but really, um, we're looking to, to, to do um, a great metal one that will also be an income earner for this whole celebration. So that's an important aspect of this. Tom and Rebecca have met with um, uh, John Bell and Roger McNeil, who sort of headed up the, the metal process from the 375th. And um, Tom and uh, Roger and John only had a year to prepare for the, uh, for the celebration of the 375th. 
So they really didn't have sufficient time. So really, um, John and Roger shared uh, a lot of the pitfalls that they had to go through because of that lack of time with, um, with Tom and Rebecca. And we've learned a lot from that. And uh, having these two ex experts on board is, is, uh, um, is really a good thing. But we, we need this. This is, this is another funding source in, in addition to the one that Bruce just mentioned because um, we're going to have expenses um, going forward. We've got uh, a website that we're, that we're working on. We're, we're looking to, um, to have an executive director on board before long. We don't have dates nailed down yet, but um, there's a lot going on, and um, it's, I think it's all going in the, the right direction. But most importantly, this is, this is your night tonight. This is about um, what, you're, what you're contributing in the way of ideas, and not just that, but elbow grease, because we're sort of shepherding the whole process, but it's you and your ideas um, that are going to, and the people that uh, share them with you, that is going to really uh, get the hard work done. Um, not just hard work, fun work. Um, we've got three and a, four and a half years to do this. Not three and a half, four and a half years. So we, we've got a lot to do, but we have, we have the time to prepare for it the right way to make it a great celebration. So again, I thank you all, and, and I'm going to turn it over to Ruthie now. So first of all, this isn't about us. It's not about the committee. It's not about the KPM Museum. It's about all of you. It's about 400 years of people who've lived here, who've brought families here. It's all those fishermen who were lost at sea that are down on the boulevard. It's, um, it goes to the Sicilians who came in 1905. It goes to the Irish that I'm from in late 1600s. That's, that's what it's about. And um, I, ev not everyone will remember because, you know, we're all getting older, but uh, the 350th anniversary had an outstanding world-class art show in City Hall. And it was a memorable event and it, I think it lasted months right it was there months um, and it was a signature event and the 350th I had dinner with Paul Talbot actually the other night and I remember a lot from the 350th but not everything that he remembered so for example will we have a black tie dinner probably will there be a big prepared a parade probably but he reminded me that the Boston Symphony came to Gloucester High School and the Cleveland Orchestra came to Gloucester High School. And actually, when he said that, I remembered that. But there was also a, uh, a badminton contest championship. And there was a um, ping pong championship. Uh, my dream is to have an alumni Little League game. I would like to do it with alumni Red Sox, but I don't know if I can get that done. But um, uh, the Boston Bruins alumni with Gloucester High School, I mean, that's the kinds of things I would like to see happen. In terms of schedule, we really need to have things buttoned down about what's happening in 2023 by probably mid-2022. And as Bob said, the most likely the executive director would be full-time in 2023. Who knows 2022, but something. So if you think about it, yes, it's four and a half, or not quite four and a half years away, but we really have three and a half years of planning and it goes by so quickly. Um, we brought 1623 to the table in the, in the summer conversations we've had because as Lynn Parisi's dream is, is all about the people of Gloucester and the history of families. So does, it's, if anyone knows who I mean by Joe Favazza, he's 98 years old. I just happen to be really friendly with his grandson, Joel. Joe still lives on Middle Street. so. We're going to have him tell his story at 1623, it'll be filmed, about as a little kid, he witnessed the unveiling of the statue of the man at the wheel. And of course, he's 98, so we have to get this done soon. And that's, that, that's in process, we're making that happen. And as a result of the conversation that Joel had with both his grandparents, his grandmother said, well, do they wanna know what it was like growing up in the fort in the 30s? Yes, we do. So she's going to get her sisters together. She still has, and she's like 97. She has three living sisters and we'll make that happen. So those are the kinds of things we need your help with too. I'm happy to help you coordinate that with 1623 and teach you how to prepare your family members on how, to, how that will happen. But 
again, we need to hear from you. So that's what this process is all about. And um, we, we love it that you came tonight. We'll probably do a few more of these in the next year or so. And you can reach out to any of us anytime. So now, I think someone's going to take this handheld mic. Please feel free to either come up here or stay at your seat. Someone's going to record your ideas. Um, there's no idea that isn't workable. But obviously, we can't do everything. So if you have an idea, we also need your idea on how to implement it. Where does the money come from? How does it get managed? What time of year is it? That's, that's what our role is. This is a safe room. Any idea you throw against the wall, whether it sticks or not, let's hear it. I'm in charge. All righty. Give me a mic and it's all over. So um, first, I wanted to explain a little bit about the signage out front that's on the table with all the dates on it and all of that. So many of you uh, did exactly as we had hoped that you would do. Um, there is a timeline of Gloucester, obviously from 1623 to right now. Someone is moving here right now, literally. Someone is moving into an apartment, could be from anywhere right now, or a house. Whatever and whenever your family came here, you've added to Gloucester from when you got here and moving forward. You made Gloucester what it is. Again, that person arriving tonight could do amazing things in their tenure here, you know, with their families. So that was what that was about. Someone asked if it's going to go on the internet. No, no, it's not. We're just trying to piece together when everybody, you know, get the stories happening. Without naming names, there was a gentleman out in the hallway on his cell phone calling his relatives saying, so when did grandpa come here? Tell me, figure it out. I'm here, I wanna write it down. When did he come? That's exactly what we wanted to hear. We wanna hear people talking to your families, talk about the past, think about a reunion maybe, a family reunion. Reach out to the cousins elsewhere or whomever. And uh, it's, it's pretty exciting when you think of it in those terms, because we all came here at some point. I, I'm fond of telling people, unless you're a Native American Indian and you summered here in a fish camp, then you had to come here else, from elsewhere. So uh, that's what it's all about. It's all about all of us and what we've made Gloucester become, which is a pretty awesome place. So ideas, so that someone can write these down. I'll run to you wherever you are. Don't all put your hands up at once. Oh, come on, yay. <laughs> Ken Real. He arrived yesterday afternoon. I <laughs> uh, just thought about uh, maybe a reenactment of the 1623 event where the uh, Dorchester Company landed at uh, Half Moon Beach. Sounds good. I want to go way down front. It's better. They can see me better. Um, I have a few ideas and, and stuff. Uh, I have a tattoo here that says the Yankee Clipper. Anybody remember years ago the Yankee in Gloucester? Okay, there. So I got the, it says Yankee Clipper. I'm supposed to say that. It took students around. It, excuse me. It took students around the world, and uh, my father would help tie up the sailboat down State Pier when I was young with my sister and my mother and uh, and uh, and. Uh, so my father was in the Marines, and I was going to be drafted in the, in the Army, and I wasn't into that stuff. And my father was, you know, he was a Marine, period. And that was his nickname. So I went in the Navy, and uh, I basically had it made. I went from, the mayor would like this, I went from Norfolk, Virginia, Naples, Italy. Norfolk, Virginia, Naples, Italy. Norfolk, Virginia, Naples, Italy. Then two years in a row, we went to Puerto Rico for a month. Uh, it was 80 degrees, wind blowing, 20. So I got this tattoo that says uh, Yankee Clipper. I wasn't sure if it was Yankee the boat or the Yankee Clipper. So, uh, and the other thing was, uh, uh, I think, uh, I talk a little different, like down to, the, down to the boulevard, we could have something going every month or every, every few weeks. And so there's, my father used to have pigeons and stuff, so there's some people in Gloucester still have pigeons. So we get a bunch of people, and they get the pigeons down there, and they just let them all go beautiful. 
and, and they'll all go back to Gloucester where they came from or where they, they did, you know. And, and then we ought to get the, the veterans. Maybe we're getting possible we could get a plane or two to fly overhead or we can get more veterans with music in the Horribles Parade. And, uh, and uh, I do the Pride Stride a lot and we can jazz that up a little bit, you know. And uh, uh, the other thing is uh, I never used to have an umbrella till recently because I, I walk a lot, two or three miles a day. I'm in pretty good shape for my age. And uh, so I carry an umbrella. So I have an umbrella, it has eight sides on it. So maybe we can get umbrellas where they can have different names of the fishing boats on each side. We could have eight of them. The, the fishing boats maybe that are gone or some that are present. And they'd be beautiful, you know, with the umbrellas like that there. And, uh, and down stage Fort Park, maybe we can have the biggest lobster or, or fish bake ever, you know, because we're going to get tons of people, you know. And uh, we can get an awful lot of cars, uh, older cars down here and, and get them up there. And uh, uh, let's see what else I'm saying. I'm getting losing track of things here a little bit. <laughs> Why don't we get you a wrap-up show? 30 seconds? 30 <laughs> yeah, was, yeah. So any, anyway, so there's, there's a few things. I think of things as I go along, but we'll pick something out. Somewhere. Definite marketing, marketing committee guy, yeah. Hi, my name is Molly Hardy. I'm the director of the Library and Archives here at the Cape Ann Museum. And I just wanted to mention the necessity for a city archivist to capture all of these wonderful ideas that, like the work that's being done, for example, at, um, at Studio 1623 is wonderful and the, the idea that these uh, voices um, and, his, and personal histories are going to be documented is wonderful. But if there's no city archivist taking care of this um, data, essentially, that we're collecting, it won't be around for the 500th, um, and especially when we're collecting data in, um, you know, these digital formats, uh, we really need someone in the city uh, uh, system um, with the expertise. Uh, so I just would like that component to really be the question of preservation and what are we doing to preserve all of these things that we're creating. Um, um, I think it really needs to be on the table as well. Build not for today, but for tomorrow as well, right? That's what it says at City Hall. So let's get our kids involved in this whole process. Let's get the school students involved. Let's get the school community involved. Let's get the young adults involved. Let's ask the teenagers what they would like. You know, we're all up here in history, but we've got kids who are going to be the next historians. So I think it would be a good idea to involve them. Yeah, just okay, my awesome, mind. awesome. Yeah. Suggestions how I'm coming. <laughs> yeah. the, the, so just FYI, the superintendent of schools is on the steering committee, and that's all developing as well. Um, but the ideas are keep going. I, I said I would come back to this gentleman over here. I'm going to pass it this way behind you. Hi. Uh, in, uh, for the 350th anniversary, uh, I was privileged uh, to have been commissioned with my friend Peter Parsons to do an oral history uh, of Gloucester, which uh, the city then published along with Joe Garland's uh, guide uh, and uh, the, uh, the great uh, uh, book about uh, uh, the schooners, Fast and Able, uh, Gordon Thomas. Um, I, I, this is the only meeting I've been to, and I'll be very quick. Um, I'm thrilled to hear that people are already talking about capturing the voices uh, of Gloucester. And I'm thrilled to see that uh, there have been several suggestions um, uh, to do uh, oral history. And all I would add to it is that we uh, maybe do a, a kind of multimedia project in which uh, we, we videotape as well as, as, as audio tape. And, and, and bring uh, the, the visual as well as the oral together. But it sounds really great to me that uh, um, this thinking is, is underway. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So um, I want to go up front because uh, I have my colleague here with me. And um, 
I'm from Gloucester. Uh, Christine is from Rockport, and we have been working uh, for three years with a camp. Cape, uh, three years we've been working with a camp, Cape Ann Arts Alive, um, which has been really focused on culture and history in, in all of Cape Ann, though we've pretty much been right, right in the immediate area here. So um, we, we couldn't agree more with you about um, the importance of kids knowing where they are and what, the, what makes it what it is. We're working on the next, next session already. And, um, and Christina has some particular ideas uh, about this. We're, we're actually focusing on the, the 400th as um, a goal for our camp so that the kids will be ready to participate. Um, it's, an, it's a fairly wide range of ages. We start with five-year-olds who will then be nine, right? Um, and uh, we have teen mentors in there as well. So it's pretty much through young adult if, if we go all the way to 2023. Um, and, um, but I would like to say that I think it would be well for us to call it the Cape Ann 400th. And I know that there's a lot of already stuff that you've already put out, but after all, we were all, all just Cape Ann when it was 1623, as it shows out there. Um, we weren't broken apart, and we were not incorporated in 1623. So um, that's one thought that I would like you to consider. And Christina, would you? I'll say Christina Martin. Our children went to preschool together. Uh, let's see, what, what can I add to that? Um, the, uh, so I don't know what the, fe what the, what the thought is about the, this thought of, the, of a Cape Ann celebration. It, it changes the tone of things, but I think it's something worth considering in the history since other towns were part of the 400 years, 200 of those years. And the choir that we've been working with it includes kids from all these different communities. And it's so about the choir that we've been working with. It's been one of my personal dreams, which is coming to fruition with five other choir directors in the on Cape Ann, uh, in Anasquam, Gloucester, um, Lanesville, and Rockport. Um, all these different uh, choir directors and kids from all of those areas and we've made we've had such a great time the first year we celebrated Dogtown and sang songs from Dogtown the second year we were inspired by the Joan of Arc statue and learned all about the history of the Joan of Arc statue and this past year we visited Safatia and the town in the city hall and we went to the Cape Ann Museum and uh, we went and visited the statues with um, Morgan Falls Pike, the, the, the sculptor for the um, Fisherman's wife, Wives. And the, uh, had such an amazing time. And, the, and also Daisy Nell came and taught and performed with us at the Shaylin Lu Performing Arts Center. And we were so well received by everyone in all of those places. And the kids were kind of transformed. And so next year, we're going to be um, focusing on the industries of the of the Cape Ann area, so our focus is very much a part of the whole of Cape Ann, and um, and we in, are including all the kids in Cape Ann, and so um, with this this historical this historical focus, hoping that we will have a group, a sizable group, perhaps eventually in collaboration with the schools in the area, so that. The, the kids will be able to participate in a, in a children's chorus that participates throughout the year in all of these celebrations. And I, I know that uh, children's choruses, for instance, there's a very active chorus in the Worcester County and a very active chorus in Springfield and in Western Massachusetts. And I've thought that Cape Ann is a defined, well enough defined community to have one of our own too, and we certainly have the talent. So. Thank you. 
It's so heartening to hear all of these stories because that's exactly what, what we envision as well. It doesn't matter where the kids are from, they're celebrating. I mean, who can pick out, well, you're, you got a Rockwood voice, I hear it. No, 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 that's not what it's about. It's about just celebrating the people that made all of this, this. Uh, Rockwood was part of Gloucester until 1840. Rockwood will be invited to celebrate as well, and whether they choose to do whatever they want to do, it's immaterial to us as a committee because we're not producing anything. I mean, you know, with the city, of course, we probably, naturally, because I say naturally probably because maybe, it isn't, it isn't etched in stone, we haven't even begun to talk about it, but the signature events, you know, parade and da-da-da, all the bigger picture stuff, yes. But all the rest of this, to form a chorus with children, I mean, that's, that's fabulous. But we won't be doing that, so, you can, <laughs> and, and right, and we're, we're the conduit. Think of the steering committee as the conduit for all of this stuff. For instance, there's children here. There's you guys here doing the thing with children. There's the Gloucester schools, lots of children there as well. There's Rockport schools. Those people need to reach out for each other, make it all happen, whip it into something amazing, which it certainly will be. Any kid singing anything is amazing. And then we figure out like, okay, where do you perform? How does this work? Ba -da -da -da, all of the, those details. But it really is about connecting. It's about connecting the dots. You know, for any of the ideas, all the ideas, as Bruce said, all the ideas are fabulous. How do you connect those into something you really can put out there? You do that by reaching out to like minds or the talent. You have the idea, someone's got the talent, someone's, you know that thing with Mickey Rooney? My dad's got a barn, let's have a show. That's it. There was Mickey Rooney, someone had the idea, someone's dad had a barn, let's have a show. That's kind of the mentality if you think of it that way. Yes. Hi, Isabel Pett. Um, so just thinking about ways to engage um, some of the younger generations. Um, I think that just expecting people to show up, planning something cool and expecting people to show up is not going to be the most um, productive way to go about it. But there are a lot of younger generations who are um, people in the younger generations who are our leaders in our community. Um, so I think it's about identifying those people and then either bringing them and their community into um, an existing event. For example, um, Fish Do Box Derby and taking younger local mechanics and pitting them against each other and having a competition um, or picking a local individual and centering a new thing around them, for example, a cooking class at Pasteo. So if there's these younger leaders in our community, they have community around them. So if we can put them at the forefront and put their face at the forefront of something, then those other people are going to show up. I see, I see a lot of people, um, for example, um, uh, Whistle Stop Mall has a lot of new shops that are owned by um, members of the younger generation in the community. And whenever they have events, I see tons of people my age there. But if I go to something else random in the community, maybe not so much, like right now. Um, so I think really pinpointing these people is going to be key. Um, another thing quickly, um, I think I maybe was six years old when we had Clear Away. Um, Carl Thompson's um, dance production, which had a lot of local musicians who created custom works for the show. Um, so uh, a production like that, which is about the history in the community, it involves local dancers and musicians who are creating custom works just for this event. I think that would be fantastic. Um, and then third thing is that this is um, obviously the second open forum we've had and the second one that I've been at. I would love to see if we do another one, maybe a little bit more structure. Um, you know, I think that if we all bounce around with different arenas, ideas in different arenas, it's very distracting. But if we can focus first on arts and culture and then next on involving like youth youth and then next on millennials and then next on tech space, I think it's a little bit easier for everybody to wrap their brains around things and also bounce off of each other's ideas instead of just sitting and thinking about what we want to say next, which may not have anything to do with what the person before said. <laughs> Does that idea resonate with y'all? The notion of the next forum being more topical specific? Yes. Yes. Yeah, we needed to do this twice. Right.
right? Just get to the next level. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, but I love everything you said. Some of what we've been talking about in board, you know, in the steering committee meetings is, I think it's fabulous that you've been here twice and everybody else out there got all the same news that we put out. I mean, clearly we need to get news to younger people and then younger people need to step up because you're here twice. I got kids too, are they here? No. <laughs> so I hear you, I do hear you. But I think that there will be lots of um, potential for involvement from them and I get it, they need to feel more invited and more a part of it. But I will also offer, I worked on the 350th, believe it or not, I look good for my age, considering Bruce. Um, I did work on the 350th and what I remember from that, um, Paul Lundberg in particular, Bruce Toby, is that um, the groups that we were involved with pulled us in. I'm thinking of the plays that Nan Weber did. How I missed the harbor uh, thing, light, you know, the harbor, oh my gosh, what's it called? The harbor, light up the harbor thing. Anyway, I missed that because we were in a dress rehearsal for a play. We did three plays that summer. Um, however, I did do the follow spot for the Miss Gloucester contest at Gloucester High School. And I also worked on the uh, Cleveland Symphony. And I worked on the BSO as well. But anyways, so there will be lots more opportunities. Um, but as Ruth said, this is for gathering information right now. And trying to see what people really are thinking. What, what are people thinking? So as Ruth also said, it's kind of a given. There'll be a parade. There'll be... You know, I mean, I, when Ruth said, well, we should think about a ball, I'm like, shoot me. That's so not my thing. But is it a lot of people's things? Absolutely. So then what are other things that people can do? You know what I mean? So it's all about putting all of the ideas together, and as Bruce said, throw it against the wall, and see who will run with it. Because we clearly can't run with all this, and I mean, that would, that's crazy from the get-go, just that notion. But can we be, as I said, can we be that conduit? Absolutely. So, saw your hand up back here. Yes, be right with you, Ken. So, my name is Valerie Nelson. I'm on the board of the Lanesville Community Center. And we certainly, as a center, are very interested in contributing and participating in whatever evolves. But I have a few thoughts um, based on the work that we've been doing out there, um, just for consideration. Um, we did a survey of our neighborhood and there was so much interest in culture and heritage that we started to think what our programming would be. And, but first, as a, the similarity is I came to a meeting around a new fisheries exhibit and learned that all everywhere there's so much interest, not in artifacts anymore, as much as really delving into who were these people? What was their life like day to day? And how, what was their community life together? And I remember sitting looking back at the uh, granite quarries, which are out in Lanesville, and realizing that the sculpture in the quarries, this is artifact material. But the same thing is true in Lanesville. People are dying to know who were the people out there? What did they do day to day? And what was the neighborhood like? And so, slowly we've emerged with a whole program of arts and culture and history that I think is working really well. I brought along, this is, in May we had a concert of Finnish music, Finnish American music. This is a 1903 photo of the Wayno band with all the little kids involved. And it was the most incredible three hour evening event in May where the vitality of the people through the music that they lived uh, with and produced and what happened in the Finn Halls. And it was just a tremendously vital event because it related to life and meaning and what this community was like. And I did listen to the uh, 1623 studios of the first event at City Hall and heard a lot about past, present, and future. And this question that we're all obsessed with is who are we in Gloucester and what will we become? And there's so much to learn from our past. Certainly we found this in Lanesville. Looking at the life of the Finns in the 20s and 30s and how they went to the halls, the unions they had and the cooperative stores 
and the dancing and the plays and on and on relates so much to what our neighborhood now is in Lanesville. This is where that community neighborliness came from. This is where that modesty of our, ar ar our architecture came from, etc. So I believe for Gloucester as a whole, there may be some lessons in here about the real desire of people is to understand who we are, who were we, what will we become, and you can do so much of that through the arts. We did it through music. Next May, we're going to do theater. We'll have drama selections of what the Finns put on in the Finn halls. And ultimately, as we kind of, uh, their era was 1890, the real renaissance of Lanesville with the sculptors and all of that up through the 50s, say. But we'll have more time by 2023 to go back earlier to the Lanes and the Irish and the same question that is Russell Hobbs is bringing up, et cetera, of who were these people? How did they live? And what was their culture and community life? Because in that, those stories, are the answers that we're yearning for of what makes Gloucester so special? Who are we? How do we live together? What are our cultures and our neighborliness and our caring for each other? And those are the lessons that can come out of this that we know we should take forward into the future, which is a theme that you brought up at your first meeting and we're re resonating with in Lanesville, listening, hearing, and we'll, we'll participate in uh, for our neighborhood and in So Valerie brings up a perfect example of how everyone can help us with this whole project because there was a big ad in the Gloucester Daily Times, it was July or August, and the KPN Finns were having their annual meeting at the Lanesville Community House, and I called him right up. It's Bob Ranta, and I said, hey, um, I know what you people are all doing out in Lanesville, but this is what's happening with Gloucester 400, and we want that to be part of what we're doing. So they haven't done it yet, but he brought it up at the meeting that I could not attend that day because it was the night, same night or something. Um, but getting them together uh, where they would be filmed by 1623 Studios at the studio with professional equipment to tell the story that they're building. So it's, it's a perfect example of what our mission is. And that's how having these types of meetings, even though we might be kind of all over the place, um, helps ev to educate everyone, by everyone who's here tonight, by w what we see as, as the vision. And you know, we want to celebrate the past because it took a lot of heartbreak and tears to get here, as well as a lot of hard work. But she's right. It's also about keeping ourselves for the future. Also, I want to add that um, the steering committee, we were talking about um, going to do outreach. We're doing community outreach at civic meetings, church meetings, any meeting of you know two or three or more people that uh, may want to do the same thing that Valerie has described um, down in Lanesville. Well, that's it. The UU Church already is doing that. I'm part of the outreach committee. And I'm happy to say that my first meeting to go talk to people about the 400th, because they were totally, they knew it was coming, but they didn't know any of this stuff, um, is the Daughters of the American Revolution. They're all over it. They're like, can you come talk to us? And I'm like, uh, yeah. So I'm going there November 4th at Spear and Hall. A whole nother thing, you know what I mean? Because I mean, just the whole Spear and Hall part. There are so many things. I, I think of it as a big fabric when you think of all the threads and all the whoop and the wharf and the whole thing, everybody's got a story. Everybody came from somewhere, everybody brought their baggage, good, the bad, and the ugly, and it all wove together and somehow we all got here, you know? So it's really quite cool. So we imagine, we anticipate lots and lots of organizations having their own celebration in whatever way they want to do it whether it's uh, a music thing, or whether it's their, just their regular annual meeting, maybe they only meet once a year, but it's a real kick-ass meeting in 2023, and they do whatever they want to do with it. Maybe they publish a little history about their organization. My grandmother on my dad's side was 
a companion of the forest. She had a little gold pin. I found it after cleaning out the homestead. Little, it was all, it was a gold pin, companions of the forest, all in gold. I'm like, what the heck is that? So I looked it up, found out the history and stuff. And they would put things in the newspaper, and you know, Mary Doyle poured at the meeting of the companions of the forest. How cool is that? I mean, who knew about that? Not me. But I mean, those kind of things, you know? And not to give a name away, but even this evening, someone else signing the timeline out there shared with me that I said, so when did your family come? And he said, I don't know, because my grandfather was an orphan. I said, oh, I didn't know that. He said, yeah, I found out when we buried him. And um, who knew? And it was a prominent Gloucester family who took him in at the age of 16 from the YMCA. And now he's got a huge, awesome, and amazing family. How cool is that? That's totally a Gloucester thing, you know? And uh, so that can spur other conversations with his huge family, because they have grandchildren of the yin yang. So I, it's just so important to bring all that past forward. Is the past boring? No, not when it's your family, right? So it's kind of cool. So if you have an organization that you're involved with and you want one of us to come and speak to your organization um, so that you know people can all group together, because no one expects any one of you to pull off something either. But we do, um, another goal is to have an event or something commemorative every day of the year in 2023. Whether it's a small little get together of uh, Ken Reel's family from all around the United States, even though he has only been here for a few years. That's what I meant. It's Ken, Ken, Re Ken but there's too many Kens. <laughs> Ken Hecht. Maybe Ken Reel wants to do that from Essex because he's probably really from Gloucester. But anyways, you get my point uh, that maybe, you know, it doesn't matter when you got here, you can celebrate. So, given that, yes, ma'am. So, I'm Maggie Rouser, and um, I admire everything that's being done. Um, however, I'm sitting here and I'm feeling a little bit more, more and more overwhelmed by the number of ideas that are f coming out many of them good. So I'm thinking, well, what is the process? What is the timeline? We've got three and a half years, I think you said before, we have need to have it all in organized form. But I don't have a sense at the moment, aside from the four of you, as to, and you're obviously doing a great job, but, you know, what is the found what is the organization what is the timeline for all the events and um i would be remiss in not mentioning um, what i think should be a major goal for this um 400th anniversary is um a new archives building for the city um uh, if we are all celebrating the past, then we need to have something that shows we celebrated the past, and the past is important. So um, I would like to suggest that we go for, you know, at least one really big goal. It's either a performing arts center or an archive center or something. So I'll shut down. I, I want to speak to that if I could. Comment. Just if I can't be heard without this, Nan Webb is going to come down here and beat me with a stick. Um, the legacy project is a big part of our uh, ambition. Uh, the archives component has been actively discussed. I think that's going to need the legacy project and the archives piece is going to need coordination with other activities and other planners and the library's vision, for example the vision of what goes on here already at the museum, um, and it's going to need an energetic leader, and we'll be talking, Maggie. Um, <laughs> this is how it happens. Um, hmm? Well, it's a, well in, in, at the 300th anniversary, left behind um, a signature project, and that was the Man at the Wheel statue. What will be our Man at the Wheel statue? That's the legacy project question. That's, 
will, what will our version of that amazing and significant piece of sculpture be? Now, the other thing I'd like to speak to, and I don't know if Sue Silvera can hear me, and if she has the chart handy, but we have laid out the framework of an organizational structure, not because we want to be a bureaucracy, but because we are looking to establish niches which will capture and foster all of the kinds of ideas that are being discussed here. Uh, we aren't hugely organized just yet because we don't want to get calcified yet. But we are putting that structure together with key folk um, in it, uh, in each of them as, as the leaders. So for example, community outreach, Lynn's name is on it. Um, veterans, you consider the, the history of Gloucester and the current state of military and, 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 and national service that that has spawned. Um, our Veterans Agent and the uh, Veterans Council are going to spearhead that element of celebration and uh, reflection. Um, what perhaps we can commit to do is we will get up online in our Facebook page and in our soon to be launched, Kathy, maybe I can ask you to give a rundown. Website? <laughs> because then this could be one of the first things we post there. Again, is food for thought. What are we missing? If there are names missing, that, you know, there's no leader, who might it be? But maybe we could talk for a minute about that as another important piece of the organizational component, the communications. I think we've just had a few, really one formal meeting so far. So we are depending primarily on Facebook for right now. And then we're getting different um, sections together for the website. So this will develop as things ideas come up in different categories and we might put stories of different families on there, um, a lot of photos, um, timelines, announcements of what's going to be happening, um, requests to get people involved and that type of thing. So it hasn't really, the website hasn't been built yet and rolled out, but it will be soon, I would say in the next month. Also, we have a 365-day calendar that Suzanne brings to every meeting, and we haven't plotted anything on it yet. We don't have to do that today, but does it have to be done within the next three and a half years? Yes. The calendar really needs to be set long before January 1st of 2023. Yeah. <laughs> Too many years floating around here. So we, we, this is... You know, we're sort of new at this. You know, it's only been a year, even though a year is a good, you know, a long time. But you can tell by our vision and our missions that, you know, we're big thinkers. Thinkers. And we'll make a lot happen, but we won't be able to make a lot happen without the help of everyone in this room just throwing out ideas. Um, so, so Chris Sicaranza is working with us to build the website. And one of the, it, it was not, it's not been delayed, but we're still, it's all about ideas on how it should look and the logo is almost ready to launch on the website so those little things the contest for the medal the website will be really important to that um, I see some drop-down menus with stories about KPN Finns um, uh, what are the Chicago bear it was at the show though the Michigan Bears if anyone knows that story about the fishing boats that came uh, I've already put that group together with 1623. So anyway, we're getting there. Yes. Yes. Hi, my name is Lynn Burke, and I have a um, nonprofit called Luminarts, and we uh, specialize in highlighting and fostering uh, the cultural events of cities and towns. And we do it through public art. And I would like to propose that we do a call for the incredible talent in Gloucester and the surrounding area to put together their most creative ideas that we can select and do a public art uh, series of storytelling through public art. Um, we do this with technology and light-based art uh, which is an incredible way of drawing a lot of attention 
and particularly the demographic that you were speaking of earlier. Um, younger people love this type of art, and it's a great way to draw attention to uh, the history of Gloucester. And I love what you said earlier about storytelling. If you all take a look at City Monmois in Montreal, that is a public art um, display of stories about individual people who lived in Montreal. And you can activate it through your cell phone and hear of the history told through individuals in Montreal. It's incredibly powerful. Thanks. Who else? Yes. With someone else who hasn't spoken yet, and then I back to you, Ken. The uh, remarkable, the community that we all live in was not here originally. It was built bit by bit over centuries by uh, innovative people, by, uh, by visionaries, by uh, gritty people. And the, the story of that is in the town records, which eventually became the city records. Gloucester has some of the oldest archival records in the country. It, they began within a few years of the first uh, settlers reaching here, and it, we have an unbroken set of town records beginning in about 1630. They are right here in this community, but they're in the basement of City Hall where a team of volunteer archivists uh, the uh, City Archives Committee has been working so diligently for about 40 years to try to get them uh, in the best possible shape and available for people to enjoy and use in researching their interests. Uh, they've made great strides and what they, what we're really lacking at this point is professional archival guidance and a safe place to store these. Some of them have been uh, ac actually uh, preserved, you know, up to, to a modern standards. Their efforts are being made to index it all, but, the, uh, but, there's, but we don't have the storage conditions. That is why when Maggie and a couple of others have said that we need to have an archival center for the city of Gloucester, it should be one of the highest priorities that we could possibly assign for, uh, for our legacy. So I would uh, uh, strongly advocate for uh, the mayor, who's here tonight, to, to take this as a priority, this, uh, the steering committee to take it as a priority, and let's see if we can get some space designated in this city to, uh, that has the right kind of preservation conditions to uh, help us keep these for hundreds more years and make them available to the public. conservation survey of the whole basement and the archives. So we have all this documentation. No, we're talking about the whole, all the city buildings, all the city's lands. We, and it's a, like a 25 year plan in place. You know, yeah, these are guys can't wait. So that's great. You know what, that's great. When they do come, we do hire them, that'd be great if you can talk to them, because that's what we're trying to do, is to figure out what we need and not waste money, not waste surveys, and not waste time and keep one things planned on a shelf. So the next generation will say, the hell they do. Yeah. yeah, I agree. It can't wait, but then I get the process as well. It's about finding the right place for it without throwing money away and all of that. Yes, and the other part of it is where does the money come from? There's that's a huge part. So Marty spoke so eloquently. I can see him on that committee just saying, Maggie. And then if we know where we're going to build the school, then what school's left over could be used for archive, could be used for a fire station. Until we have all the dominoes in place. Right. Because you don't want to keep not using the buildings we have right. that could be used for right. right. If let's say, please don't go crazy, let's say behold, 
fire station we have now on School Street decides it's going to go someplace else. Well, right there, that less money than we put a lot well, it fits into the campus and the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other thing to keep in your mind, too, is that nothing that has been said or whatever in the way of uh, capital improvements, any of that kind of stuff, has to be done in January 1st, 2023. I mean, the um, Man at the Wheel statue, for instance, was commissioned for 20, I mean, uh, 1923, didn't get erected until 1925. So, I mean, there's, you know what I mean? Everything takes time. Yes. Other thing to remember too is that the city needn't hold the keys to unlock all doors. Um, unless I'm wrong, my memory tells me the man at the wheel was erected with private subscriptions. We've got the benefit of 501c3 that could perhaps roll, get things rolling for, if you will, a private subscription to do that kind of facility. So it's really for the people um, doesn't get caught up in low bid construction, doesn't get caught up in um, all the issues that make it complication. Um, and it really becomes a community thing that way. So there are, there's not just a single way, there are many ways. Mm -hmm. And yet the city could be enormously supportive. So I, just to throw out an alternative way of looking at it, and we have a lot of the city is not the solution. Mm -hmm. City's got sand for it. Does. Any time. Yep, it does. Who else before Ken? We're getting to you, Ken. Hi, my name is um, Errol Smeichler. I'm a recent resident of Gloucester. Um, based on what I've, I've been hearing tonight, um, I've heard a phrase that sort of sparked an idea that I've had for quite a while since I've heard of Gloucester 400. And that phrase is heartbreak and tears. I think it probably came from Ruth. For me, heartbreak and tears make riveting theater. Um, so I'm thinking that all these individuals, the different regions within Cape, um, Cape Ann, um, they could be a form of old Sturbridge village, what they have done down, what they have done down there that we could do with various um, cultural groups within, um, within Cape, Cape Ann. Um, they are larger than life characters that have never heard of until I came to Gloucester, such as Blackburn. Certainly a theater, Black, Blackburn and, and, and the sea, um, those would be riveting theater. So I'm thinking that, uh, I forgot, uh, I didn't get your name, um, an idea that was brought up by one of our younger speaker, that probably somewhere in the next meeting, we should sort of break into pods. If we do that in advance, invite the folks would be in theater from a school, from professional, and within those you have discussion and dialogue. That would be a good way to move forward without things being spread out as, you know, as they are in the first two meetings that we have. So um, I, I'm thinking that things like the re reenactment um, the famous Navy battle between the militia and the Redcoats, um, which took place, even a scaled down version, I know it's very expensive to do that. These are events that can be documented. A movie or something can be made of them, and they're still, they will be generating revenue. Because I know people like, um, organizations like Net Netflix and, and all those, they're dying to get content. And this is, this would be content that people would be streaming all from Massachusetts to come and see, and to see after, as it's documented. Thank you. Thank you. Just very um, quickly, as we still have people here at the meeting, and we talked about getting things down in, into our archives, getting the archives, you know, a, a real archive going. But we also talked about involving 1623, and getting these interviews with people. Um, that's why it initially suggested the uh, Joe Favazzi interview. Another one that the mayor um, would uh, agree, um, Ron Gilson uh, needs to be um, recorded about the fishing industry. 
Um, Peter Anastas has done much of this uh, back with the um, 350th and the oral histories, but I just want to ask if there's anyone that's here, if you know of someone, again, especially, again, not the younger crowd, but the, the older crowd, if there's a story that does need to be told, these oral histories not need to be not only oral, but visual histories, and then we need to, you know, and we'll figure out how to get the archives to hold all of this. But we need these stories, and if you know anyone that has any sort of a story that tells something about our first 400 years, we need to have your input to get in touch with us, and then Ruth um, uh, or Lynn or whoever uh, can work with you uh, to get them to, to get things down and get it recorded. Um, some, some of these people may not be with us, but uh, we need to do that. So if you have any ideas or if you, in your discussions you know anyone that um, needs to have uh, something to, to add to this uh, that we will otherwise lose, uh, please speak, speak up about it. Uh, J.D. McAfee, I'll do this very quickly. I'm going to be handling a lot of things on the sporting end uh, because there's some historic events that uh, happened here, and the one we're going to really concentrate on, and we've got it off the ground, is the Around the Cape race, uh, which uh, back for the 350th was a 20K. And back in those days, you could do it, but the uh, esteemed uh, running master of this uh, great town of ours uh, Dave Dunsky put together a national level competition. You, you can't do that now, it costs thousands upon thousands of dollars, but we still have an esteemed runner as part of your group, and that's uh, Mr. Gillis up there. And I'm gonna coordinate with him as we go, and I've got some other esteemed runners around here, but they're very modest. But the uh, 350th was a, as I said, national level, it's a 20K, that's what we're going to do. And it was the breakthrough race uh, for Bill Rogers, who went on to be a very, very famous runner. And, uh, and looking back, uh, as far as we can, about running stuff, uh, there was organized running a long, long, long way back here in Gloucester. So we will have a 20K as part of the 400th. Thank you, Coach. It's funny, I mentioned to Bob Gillis early, early on about, remember the Red Men organization over in West Gloucester and they did their race? Yes, Bob remembered. But anyways, there's the, we, we are racy people. Just a quick reminder, the, uh, if you look at the slideshow, the maritime history of Gloucester is clearly important, and, and it is still developing. As we all know, there's a, now an effort. Uh, there is a new sort of high school being built on the waterfront, so there's a whole maritime history goes through our entire history, and I really think we've... Um, we really need to spend some time focusing on that uh, from the very beginning to today. And whether we can get the tall ships down here or something like that, that would be terrific. But I really, with all the other wonderful things that Cape Ann does, I really think we've got to, we've got to spend uh, some focus on the maritime history. As Valerie said, uh so nicely and eloquently about Lanesville people, there are organizations in Gloucester already talking about what, you know, they're talking about it. They don't know what they're going to do, but they're already talking about it. Harold Burnham could go on for, I don't know, three hours about all the things that he could do to think up ideas, you know, of what could happen regarding just schooner building, just schooner building. So, I mean, there are, there are people talking, there are organizations happening. Cape and Museum is like, they're rare, raring to go, which is fantastic. Um, so, there are people, or it's not just emanating from here, you know, is what, uh, my point. Hi, Melanie, Murray Brown from Gloucester Stage. Um, really just wanted to say thank you for holding this and we hope to be more involved and my colleague Chris Griffith is here as well. Um, also, just shameless plug, we are now showing my station in life, which is um, the story of Simon Geller, 
the voice of Cape Ann. So you should see it because it is part of Gloucester's history and um, we've extended the run until the 28th of October. So I'd love to see you all there. And um, yeah, so thanks for having this meeting and we'll be more involved. Just quickly to echo on the importance of the archives, which uh, I believe in 100%. There was a great exhibit here at the museum called Unfolding Histories, which Molly uh, curated. And what it did was display some of that archival material that showed exactly what city government was all about 200 years ago. You know, today, uh, the mayor and uh, the councilors, we kind of administer and manage but back 200 years ago, they were building a community, and these are and the uh, materials that describe what the city council was actually doing back then, in terms of social welfare and in terms of how the tax system was being created and how the the forgivenesses that were necessary to make sure everybody could participate. Things like that are just fascinating. So uh, that's something that we want to focus some time on for the, uh, and, and I'd be glad to uh, participate in that focus. Ken Hecht Ward, too, and I was thinking, Ruth, as you were talking about, you know, things that needed to be done earlier, and, and what comes to mind for me is infrastructure. Now, you're going to, what are we talking about, sewers and, you know, water pipes? No. But who's been on, at our beautiful gardens on the other side of the river at the boulevard that generous gardeners put together? I mean, it's just unbelievable. This, to me, that's our, our, our Versailles. And so when we start thinking about infrastructure, what are the kinds of things we have to be thinking about now so we hit that target in four and a half years? Those are the long lead items, the infrastructure. So I visualize the near side of the river where the fisherman's statue is matching the far side of the river where the fisherman's wife statue is. If, if that infrastructure could be improved and through grants, sometimes communities and cities across the world, they have Olympics, they have world fairs. And these can open up other opportunities for grant funds because it's special events. So I'm not sure if you know, we can obtain the kinds of grants that we need to do the kind of infrastructure, infrastructure that would be mind-blowing. But I think I would be very interested in helping to organize that effort where we could have the near side of the boulevard match the far side of the boulevard, have the, the generous- you come in June, you don't have to wait to 223, it's happening. It's already happening? It's happening, it's in the works. It's done. <laughs> Way to be mayor. Then, then, then I would say. You know what I mean? Generous gardens are number one people, and they are on top of this whole city. So applause to generous gardens. Oh, absolutely, they're amazing. And, and, and website where you can donate. Exactly, and and there's you know that infrastructure as well, the new wall, the stone wall, the rail. I mean, all all of that. What I'm talking about, and then connecting all that infrastructure wise to the downtown area, to Rod Street, to Maine, so that the sidewalks are very presentable and very uh, inviting, so that we're going to have a bunch of people that are from our own city walking around, enjoying all these events, and also we'll have visitors from all over the world enjoying these events. And we want to have our infrastructure really be beautiful and serviceable and have it be one of the kinds of things that are left behind from Olympic events and World's Fairs. These kinds of infrastructures, the Fisherman Statue, there's leave-behinds, and we have to prepare, plan these leave-behinds. So, I think that's something that we have to focus on near term right now because four and a half years is over like that and infrastructure. Thank you. Great. Um, I could share with you too that I've gone to the Plymouth 400 meetings down in Plymouth. Um, this would be the fifth year, except they aren't having one this year because they're past all of this part. But the first one that I went to in Plymouth, again, five years ago, they um, had a law in place and they had a couple of different forums that other Massachusetts 400 uh, people could go to. So I took it upon myself to go. And I decided to go to the infrastructure and beginning part of it to figure out what they were doing. Their DPW guy ran that particular forum. He had a million flip charts and a whole ton of everything that they were doing. And he, with the, with the city of Plymouth, town of Plymouth, and um, their councilors or town manager, I'm not sure what the government is, but anyway, they had been working on it for a while, anticipating, and of course, we aren't Plymouth, we aren't with, you know, Plymouth P Town, it's both communities together. They anticipate hundreds of thousands of people visiting in 2020. That meant more parking, it meant more uh, 
signage. It meant more bathroom facilities. It meant coordinating rooms for these people to stay in. And uh, they, they're wise enough to know. Awesomeness. Go Sox. We agree. Go Sox. <laughs> Go Sox. His priorities are correct. So anyways, the point is, is that yes, it is all about infrastructure. We haven't even gone there yet. But the ideal would be to obviously bring suggestions to the city, to the mayor, to the DPW, to councillors. We're so thrilled to have councillors here. It's the way to go. Because there is a lot that needs to happen just for all the citizens who are here because this is about all of us, but all of our families coming here. And at whatever we do, if it's good for us, it'll be good for visitors. Also, we're also part of Mass 400. There are 10 communities in Mass 400 that lead the way for the country. It's sweeping across the country. We're at the forefront. It starts with Plymouth P-Town in 2020, ends with Boston in 2030. We're 2023, Salem 2025, 26. Uh, it keeps going. Be right with you. So, yes, to what you're saying. So, if you, city councilors and chair, can start those wheels clicking, because certainly that's not our wheelhouse, and I'm grateful for that. <laughs> Valerie, first, then you're right. Thank you again. Um, just a cautionary note, Roots. <laughs> um, I was just starting to realize that uh, it, to be... Re I want to just say, be really careful that this 400th event not be an occasion to transform the whole look of Gloucester. Public art, maybe that's temporary, maybe that's really great. Or anything that has a permanent footprint has to be done really carefully because we've been living through an era recently where there's such divisiveness over things that are proposed to be done, sometimes they are, and then they're like the painted crosswalks that are still out there, left such a stain of um, resistance. And why did you think that that's what we as a community wanted to look like? There's a core sense of, of us of, of being an authentic place. And at the meeting that I watched, you guys said, this is for us who live here, not for the visitor and not for some different Gloucester that is envisioned by some tourism agenda. And these are very divisive things, the look and feel of this place. And you step on it, and it leaves ripples of discontent and, and divisiveness in the community. So anything that ha changes the look of Gloucester needs to be agreed to, or temporary, or something not an imposition of a total change in who we are and what we look like because that's not for us and it's just be really sensitive to this kind of stuff does that make sense for you totally. i don't i don't believe anyone has even no, thought that either no there there are there are but not right here <laughs> but no <laughs> There are uh, two more fundamental parts of our legacy that uh, that could be developed as as part of this celebration, which uh, which at the present time, to my awareness, are not visible in Gloucester at all, and that has to do with immigration and the growth and the uh, growth of Gloucester and the uh, granite quarrying industries. I don't think that either in in private institutions or on public displays that you can find out much about these and it would be a great uh, improvement to the city if it were available uh, in, to the public eye. Anyone else? Yes. Um, Carol Murray, um, you made a great point, Barry, about the stories and the people. And this is, it's been resonating in my head since I got to the meeting tonight. And all I can see is like faces of Gloucester and the stories. And each one of us knows a handful or more people that need to tell their story. Where can we each, you Ruth, we'll give you the information. You'll be, great. Okay, that's what I wanna know because I'm, and they're getting up there in age and they have great stories. I mean, fabulous. 
What's that? Can you imagine living on radio? Oh my God. And, you know, the other thing I can see faces. <laughs> it's her mom. I worked with her mom. My mom was getting up. Yeah. <laughs> collage sort of thing yeah 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 well I know both sides of Carol's family and her her you know extended family her families alone could fill reels and reels of video you know yes just um, jumping off of the granite theme, this is probably a little crazy of an idea, but in terms of legacy, um, I know that a lot of the east coast of the country is built off of Gloucester granite, um, like just curbs in general of entire towns and cities. So something that would be very cool is if we could create plaques to send to um, the elected officials of those cities for them to install somewhere, um, talking about how half of their town is courtesy of Gloucester. Just might be a, a little too logistical of a nightmare, but just an idea. Anyone else? Because I'm a Red Sox fan as well. <laughs> wants to wrap it up over here. Awesome. First of all, I just want to thank um, uh, KPM Museum for hosting us tonight. Uh, Courtney did a great job. <laughs> this is a fabulous venue and, and one that we should all spend a lot more time with, but um, this has been great. Uh, appreciate all your ideas. Uh, what else? We'll be doing this again before too long. Anything to add? Yeah. We'll, we'll generate a collective summary of this. It'll hopefully, if you if you write it for the newspaper, they will print it. So we're going to do that, and um, again, use that as more food for thought. And there is some Facebook, and there is an email address, which of course I don't remember. It's Gloucester four hundred at gmail. Yes. Gloucester four hundred at gmail dot com. Could I ask one thing? Uh, so. I will often say that I know nothing but I can synthesize. Um, and I've tried to synthesize this down to really broad um, buckets. A lot of talk of kids, and that could be cross-cutting. A lot of talk of the arts, ditto. The legacy project, and particularly the archives piece, I think generated some enthusiasm and interest in this room tonight. And then last but not least, um, Stories of the people. I heard that phrase over and over and over again. Um, and, and that's both audio, visual. Um, did I miss anything? Were those the big buckets tonight? Maritime? Yep, goes with, yeah, and shouldn't, I shouldn't say this, but it goes without saying, but it does, it does need to be noted. It's done. Yep, it'll be done. Thank you. Well, I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you all. The Red Sox are up three to two in the bottom of the seventh at the moment. Yep.